So today we have exciting panel session here uh, with participation from Ford as well as from uh, AI Institute. I think we'll hear exciting things about AI and autonomous vehicles, as well as AI Institute from uh, NYU, looking at how AI should be used in terms of really making a difference in good ways to life. So I'm very excited to welcome our host, Kara Swisher. I think you all know her well, uh, Executive Director of Recode. Kara. Thank you so much. I think we're all relieved to know that now McDonald's can more efficiently make us obese. It's great. <laughs> so exciting technology. Um, so anyway, I, we're, I'm, I'm hoping this is going to be a great thing. We're, we're doing a lot more things in Washington. I'm living here part time. Um, but we wanted, we wanted to do something interesting to talk about AOI from a social point of view, a regulatory point of view, a business point of view, and different things to talk about it. Because it is, while well, Sanjay does paint a picture of uh, of, uh, that is happier, there are a lot of challenges facing AI and danger uh, for the human race, really. Not in a Terminator-like way, uh, perhaps. Um, but there are some issues we have to think about really hard. And as we've seen from what's gone on with social media, uh, you ain't seen nothing yet when it comes to AI. And so it's a really important thing to talk about and debate and understand and regulate, too. Um, and so to begin, I want to talk to two people I really have great regard for, uh, Kate Crawford and Meredith Whitaker. They're with the AI Now Institute. Come on out, you guys. Uh, we're having a competitive leather coat situation here. <laughs> Yours is cooler. We both win. It, we both win, that's true. The audience wins. Um, so, uh, so I want to start off talking about, let's talk about what you guys do. What, what, uh, because you all are studying AI in a much more critical fashion and where it goes. So first of all, talk about what the AI Insti Now Institute is and how you look at what your goals are. Yeah, happy to. I mean, essentially we started really about four years ago by realizing, um, by looking around internationally and realizing there wasn't a single AI Institute that was focused on the social, political, and ethical implications of these tools. Right. Um, and so Meredith and I realized that we had to make our lives a lot harder and actually do it ourselves. And so now we head the AI Now Institute at NYU. And it's really the world's first institute to really center these concerns. And we created it essentially as an interdisciplinary institute. Mm -hmm. That we can't be resolving these issues just from computer science and from engineering departments. We actually need a much bigger lens. We need to be drawing on social science on humanistic disciplines, on law, philosophy, as well as anthropology, sociology, criminal justice. If you actually want to build tools that affect social institutions, you need to have experts in the room, but you also need affected communities, mm -hmm. people who are likely to see the downsides. So that was the, the inspiration for creating AI Now, and um, it's been keeping us pretty busy. Mm -hmm. All right, and Meredith, you also work at Google. Yes, I am, I'm here in my AI Now capacity today, but I do have a dual affiliation. All right, explain what you do at both places. So a, how did you look at starting this? So you're at a company which is pretty much controls AI right now at this point. It's, it's oh, one of the big players. One um, of the big players, yeah. We can say. Um, well, I mean, my path was through industry, right? I had been at Google for over a decade. I ran a research group there. And I think Kate and I came to very similar conclusions that were, you know, fairly heterodox during my days in industry um, through very different paths. So mm -hmm. Kate has been an academic. She's one of the founders of the field. She's been studying this stuff for over a decade. Um, I worked on large scale measurement systems. So I was really at the, you know, how do you deploy servers across the globe and create the kind of data that would be meaningful, right? How do you make data that has a certain type of meaning? And then how do you ensure that meaning? So I was right, you know, as Kate and I joked, the sort of epistemic guts of these questions, like, mm -hmm. how, you know, what is the ground truth? And it was constantly slipping. Mm -hmm. And I had the, you know, the, the dumb luck of being in a place where I was watching kind of the ascent of AI. I was watching people take data that I knew was faulty or fallible or incomplete and begin to pump it into AI systems and make claims about the world that I didn't believe were actually credible or verified. So basically, not to get too technical on mm -hmm. you, but the crap in, crap out rule, right? Yeah, okay. crap in, even weirder crap out. I, went, <laughs> I did not go to computer school for that, but yeah. go ahead, move yeah. along. 
Um, so Kate and I met, and I was, I was so relieved. We met on a bus on the way to a conference, and suddenly there was someone who was speaking this language and sort of you know, helping me think through ideas that I had felt you know, fairly alone in thinking about. And we started talking about this, and you know, we shared a similar set of concerns, right? If these technologies are being threaded through some of our most sensitive social institutions, what are the guardrails, mm -hmm. right? What are the guardrails when we begin to automate criminal justice based on the assumptions of people in a conference room in Silicon Valley? Mm -hmm. What are the guardrails when we begin to automate education, right. when we begin to do sort of automatic essay scoring and eye tracking for students to determine attentiveness or, you know, or, or intelligence, right? You know, how do you, how do you make sure these aren't replicating patterns of discrimination? Right, so let's talk about that issue of data because one of the, you just said something in, 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 a, in a room in Silicon Valley by mm -hmm. a group, certain group of people, which is typically the same group of people mm -hmm. that are putting them in. And I, I, I speak of pretty much, it's, you know, d the data is there, it's mostly uh, white men. Yeah. Yeah. Younger, correct? Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Yeah. yeah. Still okay. to this day. To this day. So here you have this issue where the data is going in and whether the data is correct. Let's talk about the issue of data and data as gold in Silicon Valley now. Um, what? How, how do they talk about the systems and how they're created and how you can get fault, faulty? How it moves that way? Yeah. I mean, this is actually one of the big areas for our research at AI now is really lifting up the hood on AI systems and looking at the kind of sometimes quite weird and sticky and gooey training data that goes into the pipes. Right. And some of the ways you do that is really by looking at, you know, where does that training data get sourced from? Mm -hmm. So I'll give you an example. Um, one of the studies we recently published looked specifically at predictive policing data. Right. And we thought, and explain well, this. Predict yeah, for so, so for those of you who've sort of seen how um, there are these kinds of heat maps that are used to sort of basically isolate areas in cities where basically police couldn't predict that crime might occur. Mm -hmm. Or in some cases, it's a person-based list to say this person looks like they're the sort of person who might commit a crime looking at their social network. Mm -hmm. We can ask really hard questions about whether these things work, but one of the things we wanted to really dig into is where is the data coming from? Mm -hmm. Where do they get the, the data? The original data. Yeah, the original data to right. train these systems to say, hey, check out this person or check out this neighborhood. So we ended up looking at 13 jurisdictions across the US that were specifically under legal orders because of biased or illegal or unconstitutional policing. So that means like, essentially courts have already said, you got a real problem with, it, with what's going on here, you should actually be really changing your police practices. But guess what? The data that was being created by things like planting evidence or racially biased policing was being piped into predictive policing systems. We found multiple cases, Chicago being one of the most obvious, where you could see that the data coming from what was essentially corrupt police practices was informing supposedly neutral and objective predictive policing so, platforms. So bad policing data was going into yeah. creating more bad information. So if you have dirty data right. actually forming our predictive policing systems, you're ingraining the sorts of bias and discrimination that we've seen over decades into these systems that in many ways just are above repute. Because people say, oh, well, you know, it's neutral, so it must be completely fine. Mm -hmm. And so you see these kind of vicious circles emerging because essentially of the training data itself. The, tra the data that's getting, uh, explain training data again. To yeah. Be, the, training data is you teach the systems and then they learn, right? So, but what you teach them with at the beginning is how they learn at the end. It's, it's like people, I guess. Yeah, right. yeah. It's uh, kind of like people, but people have a bit more nuance and complexity. Right. Um, um, so taking the most basic and kind of a canonical example, mm -hmm. right? You show a machine learning system 100 million pictures of cats, mm -hmm. but you've only sh shown this machine learning system, you know, cats that were colored white, mm -hmm. right? That system would then recognize cats, but probably misrecognize darker colored cats, right? Mm -hmm. um, you can show the machine si learning system any kind of large corpus of data. It models the world through that data. That's all it will ever know. That's all it can ever see. Which has already been a problem with basic search at Google, for oh, example. Well, there, you know, it it is not infallible. Right. <laughs> it is. It only reflects what's in the data, which is why this question of you know is the data coming through biased policing practices that you know have a record of arrest that is actually a record of corruption is really important because once that is filtered through one of these systems you know people take it as the product of a smart computer that it's infallible that it is sort of mathematical wizardry and you know 
probably not to be contested. Whereas if they looked at the practices that were creating that data, you would realize there was something really wrong with those right. and, and you actually need to change it. All right, so that's one example of, of dirty data. And so what you do is cleanse it? Or how do you, is that well, the right term, you have a yeah. data cleansing? Well, see, that's currently one of the things the industry is really contending with right now, which is right. you know how to create what are called fairness fixes. You know, How do we clean up the data? How do we make neutral and fair AI? Well, the more we've been doing this research, the more concerns we have about this sort of idea of a simplistic tech fix. Because in the end, you're talking about cultures of data production. And if that data is historical, then you are importing the historical biases of the past into the tools of the future. Mm -hmm. So essentially, training data from the past is deciding how decisions will be made by AI systems. That's going to be a real problem. First of all, if you can't see into the training data, if it's a proprietary company that doesn't have any kind of transparency protocols, you can't see the data. Secondly, the black box. That's what the, the, the black the box black problem. Box that, that, that is that is proprietary to companies like Google, yeah. and the two leaders in AI right now, or three really would be. Well, sometimes they say the big five, and the sometimes they say the big seven, like the number keeps mm -hmm. changing, but, but, but we're talking Google, about Google, Facebook, small Amazon, IBM, Microsoft, IBM, Microsoft, Apple, Microsoft. Microsoft. Right, yeah. yeah, and then China, and then we'll say, get to that. And then China, it's a whole right. other story. <laughs> we'll get to China. We'll get there. <laughs> exactly. got some issues over there. Exactly. <laughs> right, okay. um, so yeah, I mean, I, and I loved your example of search, because like search data is a really good thing to look at. Some of you might have seen like one of the classic search tricks you could do. This was like, you know, a couple of years ago. Yeah, we ran the CEO example in the lab and it was like, wow, it's all white dudes. And mm -hmm. in fact, the first and it actually female is, CEO that ahead. came up. Yeah. Did you, did you have a look <laughs> no, like No, but it actually is in real life. But well, go ahead and move yeah, on. Yeah, but we, what is it? We have like 9% female CEOs. You didn't even have that in right. search data, right? Right. And the first female CEO that came up in these searches that we were running at the time was Barbie CEO. <laughs> and you're like, OK, that's a problem. Right. Um, and, and it's funny, because it's kind of like a whack-a-mole problem mm -hmm. right now. right? Mm -hmm. So industry is like, oh, OK, we see a problem that we're actually like, if you look up physicist right now, you know, you'll still see some, some differences. So again, around professions, around this kind of cliche stereotypes around gender and race, you keep seeing them get reflected. And that's because of what it. you search is what you search for that's and then what you get. Well, it's actually a really complex set of issues. Partly it's that feedback effect that people are kind of searching for a generic image and they might choose a male doctor, for example. But sometimes it's because of where those images are coming from. So right. if you're scraping it from, you know, again, from very particular types of photo sets, like Getty, for example, really pushed for more diverse images of people in these kind of classic photo sets because it had become really cliched in terms of what you could get. So long story short, search is really complicated and people are trying to fix it, but it's much harder than you might imagine. Mm -hmm. And it, there keeps being more and more layers of the onion that really have to be looked at. Mm -hmm. So instead, I think we have to ask different questions around, okay, how do we think about data construction practices? How do we think about how we represent the world and the politics of AI? Because these systems are political. They're not neutral. They're not objective. Mm -hmm. They're actually made by people in rooms. And that's why it matters who's in the room, who's making the system, and what types of problems they're trying to solve. Right. So talk about the who's in the room part, uh, Meredith, because that's one of the issues that has been brought up again and again around what happens with AI. This is the... F the you probably would argue that AI is the biggest growth area for tech going forward, one of them. One of them besides, yeah. you know, self-driving would be one. There's a whole bunch yeah. of things, automation, robotics, but AI is the really big next yeah. direction of the future. Yeah. So and talk I, about that. Um, well, there was a, we, we don't have much data, but the data we do have is unequivocal and you know, our daily experience as women in tech is, you know, confirms this data and then some. Um, there was a, a Wired study that came out last year, and it said that around 12% of the papers that were submitted to the big machine learning AI conferences were submitted by women, right? So you're looking at a field that is even less diverse than the very undiverse computer science field. Mm -hmm. Right now we have about 15% women getting computer science degrees. This is down from you know, 10 years ago. Yeah. It's down from 30 years ago when you had you know, rough parity, right? So you've actually seen the field as it has grown in power and prominence. So that's and just gender, then there's people of color, yeah. there's all kinds and of it's re it. Again, that we are, you know, one of the issues is that we aren't seeing enough data on this and enough sort of emphasis on the urgency of this problem. But one anecdotal evidence is, is Tim Neat uh, Timnit Gebru, who is a you know preeminent machine vision researcher, um, she's a, a a a woman of color, and she when she first went to NeurIPS, which is the biggest machine learning co conference, she said she was one of six black people out of eight thousand. 
So she was a co-founder of Black and AI. She's been doing a huge amount of work, sort of spearheading this with a, a couple of colleagues to make you know a lot more space for Black people to participate in machine learning. Um, and there have been sort of initiatives that have been grown out of that. But that is emblematic of a huge problem because right. I'm gonna I'm gonna play the Silicon Valley people mm. I cover all the time. Mm. Meredith, why does that matter? It's really really about standards and quality. <laughs> Um, who gets to define quality, Cara? Um, right. That, well, that's fine. Um, yeah. I mean, but they say yeah. that. I mean, it's it's a meritocracy. Right. And matters. and I would say. I mean, come on, it's a meritocracy. Yeah. Only the best rise to the top, and it just happens to be seventy nine percent white men. Yeah. Drive the Tesla to the two million dollar yacht. Yeah. Um, we had coincidence. <laughs> but so yeah. what, so wh wh why? Wh what does it matter? I mean, what what is the problem? Why is that not happening? From your perspective. Why why, why are we isn't not? Why is it more diverse? Yeah. I mean, I think there are a lot of ways we could diagnose that, but I think the cost of diversity is pretty clear, right? The people who bear the costs of discrimination, of exclusion, of racism within these companies are the same people who bear the cost of bias, of errors, and of sort of, you know, I would say oppressive uses of AI outside of these companies. So there is, you know, I, there is making a direct causal link is something that you know we're going to need more research to begin to put together but there is it is very clear that the people who are benefiting from these systems match a specific demographic profile and the people who are being harmed by these systems are those who have historically been Let's marginalized. Let's talk about those benefits and harms. Yeah. What does it do in the in the new society with AI making decisions yeah. and in some cases it does notice if inefficiencies on things like crops or weather it's hard to have bias in those those kind of things have, have benefits, correct? From, from you all are, have an AI now institute, so you must like AI. Uh, talk about the benefits. Where does it work really well, and where doesn't it? Well, I, I would say, again, the answer to that question, and, and this is not to be cagey, mm -hmm. is how are you measuring benefit? And that's one of the key areas I think we need to look at more closely. Right, so in, in increasing crop yield, that might be a huge benefit, but is that coming at the expense of soil health, mm -hmm. right? Is that coming at the expense of broader ecological concerns? Is that displacing communities that used to live on that land? I'm sort of making up these examples as right. questions you'd want to ask right. before you sort of claim blanket benefits from these technologies. Mm -hmm. um, you know, similarly, like if you're looking at, at harms, Who's measuring harms to whom, right? A lot, of, you know, a lot of the issues come from setting one objective function. So this is sort of one goal for the AI system. And one we've seen a lot lately that is fairly problematic is kind of engagement in social media, right? That is the only goal that is sort of sought after in a lot of these, these boardrooms by people who are creating these systems, right? right? How do we get more engagement? Well, the collateral damage of considering you know, engagement as a sole goal has right. been, you know, falling around us for some years now. Right. Um, so I think, you know, we this need is, to... This is when you're talking about the architecture of... I had a really great podcast with Nicole Wong, who used yeah, to be yeah. chief legal counsel at Twitter and Google, and she was involved with building this... Ar helping build this architecture. And one of the things she talked about was the architecture of, say, a Google search or something on Facebook. Um, and one of the things that was interesting is you can build on, initially you can build on context, uh, uh, accuracy, and speed, and you get pretty good results when you do that. But when you start to engage, uh, when, you're, when the pillars you build are engagement, virality, and speed, mm -hmm. we end up with Alex Jones. Yeah. Like, that's where we go. That's exactly. right where we go. I mean, it does, because that's what... As you can see, there's lots of there's a very good article today in Bloomberg about that. It's it's it, it they build it for that to create it, and therefore that's what happens, exactly. and then they're surprised that it happens. Mm -hmm. So what do you? Wh I, I do want to get to the benefits because I, I do want because there are <laughs> benefits to not having these systems run just by humans or not just not at all. It doesn't. Well, this is the, this is the big question right now. So people say, look, you know, if we have. AI in, say, the criminal justice system, won't that be less biased? We've got real problems in terms of our court systems, in terms of policing. Yeah. Won't this make things better? And the question we ask is, okay, let's look at the evidence for that. What we need is a research baseline. So the reason we exist is to go and do that empirical research so that those claims are tested. One of the things that sort of keeps us up at night is if you think about the way that we check that our current systems are fair in, say, criminal justice, is that we have a system of appeals, we have a system of rulings. You actually have a thing called due process, which means you can 
check the evidence that's being brought against you. You can say, hey, this is incorrect. You can change, you can change the data. You can say, hey, you've got the wrong information about me. This is actually not how AI works right now. In many cases, decisions are going to be made about you. You're not even aware that an AI system is working in the background. Mm -hmm. Let's take HR for a classic case in point right now. Now, many of you have probably tried you know, sending CVs and resumes in to get a job. What you may not know is that in many cases, companies are using AI systems to scan those resumes to decide whether or not you're worthy of an interview. And that's fine until you start hearing about Amazon's system where they took two years to design essentially an AI automatic resume scanner. And they found that it was so biased against any female applicant that if you even had the word woman on your resume, that it went to the bottom of the pile. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was kind of extraordinary. And, and that tells us two things. One, it's actually much harder to automate these tools than you might imagine, because Amazon's got some pretty great engineers. It's not like right. they don't know what they're doing. Right. Um, and it tells and you- really, why would they want to do necessarily? Well, right? you know, it could save a lot of money. I mean, there's a right. lot of, lot of right. people want to you know, create why it. they want to put AA, but why would they want that to be the outcome? Well, they didn't, they definitely did not want that to right. be the outcome, which is why they didn't release the tool. Right. But it also tells you something about the pile of resumes that they had. What were they training it on? What was the training data? Surprise, surprise, a lot of white dudes in basically their entire engineering pool. Mm -hmm. So these tools tell us something, but of course, the next big thing in HR is gonna be even weirder. So now, if you do an interview, there's a, there's a, there's, there's a really, system, really weird system called HireVue. You might have heard of this one. A no. lot of companies are using it. You know, Goldman Sachs are using it, Unilever's using it, um, to my knowledge. And essentially, while you're being interviewed, there's you know, a camera that's recording you and it's recording all of your microfacial expressions and mm -hmm. all of the gestures you use and the intonation of your voice and then pattern matching those things that they can detect with their highest performers. Might sound like a good idea, but think about how you're basically just hiring people who look like the people you already have. Right. And, and like, you know, that's Goldman not gonna Sachs. help, guys. <laughs> like, we might have a problem with that, right? So, so this is one of those things where you're like, no one even gets to look at that system because they're like, oh yes. no, it's proprietary. Sorry guys, it's actually right. helping. It's, it's a perfectly good system. It's neutral, right. it's objective. We have to be much more critical of these systems. So right. I mean, that's really what Meredith and I do and what we stand for is saying, we will do the research to actually test these systems, which is why it's so important that we can right. so audit and There's also them. efforts on the behalf of industry to test themselves, right? Now, Google has started its own advisory panel, right? Uh, Facebook has its content moderation panel that they're hoping will save them. It won't. Um, <laughs> Newsflash. Newsflash. Yes. Newsflash. Uh, I'll, I'll be a column in the New York Times in 23 minutes. Um, uh, w talk about that. They, 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 you're not on the Google advisory panel, and you're at Google, and you're an expert in this. Is that correct? I'm not on the panel. And why is that? You would have to ask the people who put together right, the panel. Talk about these panels. Uh, maybe you can, I mean, what, what talk, go I, ahead, you start. Like, I'm happy to talk about it if, no, if you feel ahead. on the I hot seat. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm getting the, the right. ray. Um, right. um, I mean, I, so it's not just Google, right? right. You no, are it's seeing this, you know. They want to create these panels. Axon, the creator of police tech, you know, AI enhanced body cameras and police surveillance drones has an ethics board. Salesforce, it constituted something along the lines of an ethics board, um, you know, right in the wake of a kind of crisis where a lot of their workers and a lot of other people were asking them not to sell tech to ICE, right? Mm -hmm. Facebook is sort of creating this ethics panel in the wake of, you know, massive global, like controversy is a very diplomatic word for what's going on at Facebook. Mm -hmm. um, but in a sense, what you're seeing is that these panels are, you know, we use the term ethics washing, right? Mm -hmm. Where there are serious and significant questions that are at the doorstep of this industry right now, right? You know, are you going to harm humanity and specifically, you know, historically marginalized populations, or are you going to sort of get your act together and, you know, do what, you know, and, and, and make some significant structural changes to ensure that, you know, what you create is safe and, um, and, and not harmful. And I think, you know, in the in the wake of these controversies, there is a you know there has been there has been kind of a, a kind of ethics theater almost, and and we actually look at this in our 2018 report where we looked into these a little bit. There is none. It, there all of these questions around you know what do these boards actually do? Right, are product decisions run by them? Can they cancel a product decision? Do they have you know veto power otherwise? 
is there any documentation on whether their advice was taken or whether it was not? Um, and you know, are they qualified? And are they qualified, right? You know, who chooses who's on the board, right? There's a kind of recursive question here about, you know, who's guarding whom. And I think, you know, ultimately, it's, it's a great step that we're seeing these issues be taken seriously. I will say four years ago when we started doing this, it was a lonely room. There weren't that many people who were concerned. There were a lot of people who had argued that these were not problems. Now, that is not the case. These issues are serious and they're being taken seriously. But what we don't see is real accountability. What we don't see are mechanisms of oversight that actually bring the people who are most at risk of harm into the room to help shape these decisions. So let's talk about that accountability. Kate, we're here in Washington. They love to make rules here. They do. Um, they're not very good at it. We, we'd like days. a few more, I think, yeah. in this space. So talk about that. What is the what is the regulatory outlook? Because they're still trying to figure out how to deal with social media. They're still trying to deal with what, how to deal with ba privacy sort of basic stuff. Yeah, we still don't have any kind of federal privacy law, which is kind of extraordinary in this day and age. Right. Well, it's interesting. I mean, I think some of the most exciting steps have been happening at the state level. Right. We saw California pass the strongest privacy bill of the country. It's actually kind of amazing. Um, we're starting this to see- This goes force in 2020. That's right. And some people don't think it's strong enough. Compared well, to right. Europe, it certainly and, is. And it was certainly watered down from its sort of original framing. And, and we're starting to see that happen again around issues like facial recognition. You're seeing multiple states move towards actually saying, no, we need to regulate facial recognition for very good reasons, because this technology can be deeply troubling in the way that it's being used. But again, there's like a lot of fights going on about how strong those rules should be. I mean, it's interesting, we made a recommendation, um, again, from the ANL Institute based on this research, saying that, look, we think notice and consent isn't enough. We think things like facial recognition actually need to be something that we all debate and take seriously, and communities should be allowed to say, hey, no, we don't want this in our backyard, rather than just being told, hey, you've walked into public space, so basically you've already consented. I mean, that, that presents a set of concerns. But these are the debates that are happening right now at a state level. But then internationally, you see a lot more movement. So of course, we had GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulations, come into effect in Europe in 2018. And, and you know, it's interesting. It's not a perfect piece of legislation, but it has had impact internationally. Mm -hmm. So what is interesting now is that the US is facing a decision. It's like, are you gonna be regulated by other countries saying, hey, we're not gonna accept this, or are you gonna give protections to US citizens? I think this is the key moment to start making that regulation to make it real. The question is who gets a seat at the table? to decide what that's gonna look like. And this is gonna be one of the most important things that happens in the next five years, is how AI is gonna be regulated and all of those adjacent technologies. And who should play a role in that from your perspective? Obviously, federal regulators. Absolutely. Who? I mean, realistically, we see this as being something that needs to be an evidence-led process. Mm -hmm. So what we want to see is more experts. Because that's actually popular saying, these days. Yeah, you know, it's like, <laughs> can, can you actually show us how this technology yeah. works? Um, do you understand what that is? I mean, right. we saw some things. I mean, you remember sort of Mark Zuckerberg in front of Congress. I mean, that wasn't one of those shining moments of seeing how regulators really understand right. AI. Um, <laughs> I think we can do better. These um, terms of service are very, very confusing to read. <laughs> Exactly. But you did make it in your college dorm room, right, so that right, was great. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I'll say that there are some really interesting senators right now who are asking different questions, mm -hmm. and they're looking at algorithmic accountability. That's really key to see. They're having different conversations about privacy that realize that it's not just about individual privacy, it's about our collective privacy. It's the fact that like, if you make a decision in a social media network, that can affect how data from all of your contacts is being extracted as well. I think there's, a, there's an increasing level of literacy, and that's something that's super important. So yeah. we need to really support that with more and, and, and what about federal, the federal agencies? Now, it looks like the FTC is possibly getting more funding. There's some great ideas by uh, Senator Klobuchar, for example, like funding of the FTC, stronger with fines and things like that. Um, which federal agency should be the, the agency that should, should there, because I think Nancy Pelosi was talking about an agency yeah. of, of AI, really, yeah. like to, to monitor data. This is the big debate. It's, it's, there's already been a debate about this for, for many years now, which is like, do you try to give more strength to existing agencies, or do you create a new super agency for AI, right? And this is something we looked at in detail in, a, in our sort of research last year, and we, we made some recommendations specifically about, at this point, because we need 
some regulations, I'd say quite urgently. We need to empower existing agencies to do what they're doing, but to also include looking at AI, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if you're the FAA and you're you know, focused on, okay, how do we think about safety in planes? You're the right agency with the right expertise to be thinking about how AI starts to impact your particular domain. Same thing goes for the FTC. Same thing goes for many agencies where we want to say, hey, give them the power to look at these issues. Maybe one day we'll get like a super agency, but we can't wait that long. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, sorry. Yeah, I'm, I'm just a big plus one to <laughs> what Kate is saying and, and the work here. I mean, I, 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 would, I would emphasize that and I would say, you know, it's also, I think, important to delegate responsibility to experts who are coming from outside the AI domain mm -hmm. because you know at this point a lot of these questions actually aren't AI questions they aren't about you know are you using a deep neural net to do this it's about you know under what policy is this implemented in what context is it implemented was it trained on data that reflects that context is it going to be used in ways that are transparent that are contestable that are safe how is safety proven right these are all actually expertise that people from you know, dom you know, say in the healthcare domain, you would want doctors, you would want nurses unions, you would want people who understand the arcane workings of the US insurance system. You would need them all at the table on equal footing with AI experts to actually, you know, create the practices to verify and ensure that these systems are safe and beneficial. So I want to finish up the questions we had. I don't know the time, I don't know the clock here. So, um, oh, Jill can tell me. Six, six, no, no, I, I, how much time we have left. Um, what we can talk about the U.S. and what a mess it is, but China. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Facial recognition, social scores, heavy into AI. Obviously, Kai Fu Lee wrote a book that talks about this and how fast they're moving past us yep. in this area because of the interest in data. The, that that their their ability to collect data is unfettered. Um, and their citizens allow it, whether they're going out of like stores, what they're buying in stores, not just looking at what you're doing in your face, but what you pick up and put down in stores. The surveillance is everywhere. It's a, it's a surveillance economy, as far as I can tell. Yeah. But it benefits from that, because they get all kinds of insights, because you do, and that's not biased insights, that's all data. Like, and it does <laughs> reflect the world of how people are moving, whether it's transportation, whether it's anything. They can have data on everything. Is that something we've, we have got to think about? Because here's a country that's just going to be oh, yeah. swimming in data. Well, it's interesting. I mean, there, there's, there's two points here. I think when we look at things like the social credit score, which, as you know, you know. Could you explain that for yeah, those? Yeah. I mean, social credit score is kind of, it's a really interesting system. It isn't fully implemented until right. 2020. So a lot of it is a sort of speculative debate at the moment. But what we've seen already is that um, these scores are being used basically to track everything you do online. So if you spend a lot of time doing online gaming, if you spend, if you pay your bills on time, you know, then your score will go up. If you don't pay your bills on time, if you say something negative about the government on a forum, then your score goes down. And if your score is low, it impacts your ability to do everything from buying a train ticket to getting your kids into the school that you want to go to, to getting the job that you want. So it's profoundly connected to all of these other sorts of things that you'd want to do in everyday life. So that score and it moves to the physical well, world. If you jaywalk, exactly. if you exactly if you, if you jaywalk, if you you know do anything that's Spit. seems to be rude in public space, it then again your credit score goes down. So this I mean, was an episode of Black Mirror, but move along. Yeah, <laughs> as as they all are. You know, no, I no, kind I, of I always say to Silicon Valley people, just imagine what you're making as an as a your product isn't is an episode of Black Mirror and then don't do it. Sometimes, yeah. <laughs> it's like, who decided Black Mirror was like a design spec? I'm like, no guys, that's not what they're trying to say. Right. Um, right. Yeah, so I mean, look, here's the, here's the thing about the social credit score. It's really creepy and what really disturbs so many of us is that it could really change people's opportunities in life. We've already seen many, many people blocked from domestic travel. We've got real concerns about what's happening to the Uyghur population in China right now. Like, this is really scary from a human rights perspective. But here's what isn't told as much. The US has many similar systems yeah. that are either in place or about to be in place in the next couple of years. I'm sure you, you read the news that, for example, in New York, insurers can now have been given full permission to look at your social media to decide how to modulate your insurance rates. So that sounds very similar to the sorts of things that we're concerned about in China. So I think sometimes there's this tendency to think, oh, China's the bad guy, and that would never happen here. It's like, 
actually we have to do a lot of work to make sure that these tools aren't used in oppressive ways that threaten civil rights. Mm -hmm. Because we've got some real issues if we don't really start pushing back on some of and these more concerning issues. And we will say this is the AI decision, so that's yeah. it. That's Rather the problem. If, if bias or you're biased or... Exactly. So bias sometimes, bias is one problem, but it's by no means the only one. Sometimes the real question is just, should we be using AI in this context at all? Even if it works, would that be okay? Mm -hmm. That's the question we have to start asking. It's not just, let's fix it so that it's working great, then everything is fine. The question is, is it actually an appropriate technology in this context? Mm -hmm. And why, if you had to make the argument why it would be, why would that be? Well, look, you know, it's interesting. If I look at something like um, how we can reduce power costs, right? If we look specifically at the environment and climate change, there's been some really interesting work that's been done using AI systems to say, hey, we can actually modulate the use of the electricity grid to make sure we're much more efficient. We can look at how, I mean, think about how much energy is, is wasted in cities and in giant like server farms, which we've you know done lots of research in as well, looking at data centers. I mean, we can do stuff there. That mm -hmm. excites me. We've actually got big challenges, particularly on the environment side, where we can do real work. But the minute this stuff touches complex social systems, you are looking at way messier terrain. And that's mm -hmm. when you need to think much more, in a much more nuanced way about how you might be affecting people's lives. Right, Mira, China. Yeah, well, Kate said it beautifully, but you know, I wanna highlight another distinction between China and the US along those lines, right? You know, China, you have, you know, a, a party and a more or less centralized state, although it's, you know, very factionalized as well, um, that openly acknowledges these are the uses we're putting AI to, this is what it's gonna do. The social credit score is, you know, in law, they've written down what it is. You know, it is pretty transparent about the application and the purpose. There isn't much subterfuge. In the US, there is currently no law governing the application of facial recognition. There is no way for us to know if we walk in a store that we are being profiled by a facial recognition system, even though there is a new facial recognition product that is being sold to different retail stores that offers to capture the image of shoplifters and then ban them across stores they've never been to, right? So if I steal in Target and then I try to walk into a Walmart, Walmart's gonna be like, oh, stealer, get out, right? So you're looking at a set of practices in that case that is pretty similar to a social credit score in China, but under different auspices, right? The public is not aware. There is no process of you know, acknowledgement or consent there. Um, and this is happening sort of under the cover of proprietary private sector tech that is actually not disclosed to the people that it's going to affect. And so. sometimes it's in your house. I mean, mm -hmm. did you see the story this week where basically there's a rent-controlled building in Brooklyn where they're just installing facial recognition cameras? Mm -hmm. And like none of the residents are getting a say in this and they're all starting to protest and say, right. we don't want to have facial recognition in our homes. So this makes us feel like animals, like we're being tagged. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, it's in more low-income communities that are being gentrified. I mean, it's this story around we have to look at these sort of deep social and economic contexts to understand why and how these tools are being used. Right. Okay, last question. I have questions from the audience. Does Silicon Valley get this? They're very, very sorry right now, I I've noticed. Yeah. <laughs> but they're really sorry. Big yeah. mood. Really. <laughs> they're super sorry. I just um, spent, I spent the day at Facebook and they're super sorry. <laughs> Sorriest. Sorriest. Um, yeah, there's... Google's not that sorry, but go ahead. Um, well... I'm gonna do a thing where, you know, right. there are a lot of people who don't get it across right. the board, full stop. There are a lot of people who benefit from not getting it. That's a problem. Mm -hmm. There are a huge number of people who are getting it, right? You are seeing workers across tech take personal risks to protest the decisions of their employer, right? We're seeing that as one of the few checks we've actually had on these right. systems. Let, let me be clear, uh, Meredith was one of the leaders of the Google walkout, which was about, um, uh, <laughs> Google, Google paid a sexual harasser $90 million to leave. It's Thank you. It's up to 135, that's 135. on my public okay, record. All right, okay. They paid him a lot of money, and they, this was protest over lots of things, arbitration, all kinds of things, and how Google handled sexual harassment issues. Um, but go ahead, so sorry. Yeah. So I, I think there are a lot of people in these companies, they don't want to be complicit. They're close enough to the tech to know where it fails and what it is good for and what it's not good for. And they are doing a lot of work to try to steer this ship in another direction. So you know, that's actually giving me a lot of hope for Silicon Valley writ large, is that there are these forces who are, you know, a lot of these people are comfortable, right? They could have easy, easy mm -hmm. lives, but you're seeing tens of thousands of people instead turn, you know, turn to face those in, with power over them and say, you know, this is not okay. 
We actually need to think more clearly about these decisions. We need to think more clearly about the cultures we're creating. We need to think more clearly about the implications of our technology on you know, geopolitics, on our social well-being. And I think that is, that is something that gives me hope that there's actually the possibility of well, change. That's because in Silicon Valley, the workers do have power, have, have an, uh, because there's a, not enough of them, and these are high-paying jobs, these are high-skilled yeah. jobs. Yeah. Um, that said, retaliation. Do you feel that? Um, I'm, I'm here with my AI Now hat on. I would say, you know, I continue to do my work mm -hmm. and I continue to sort of act in accordance with my personal ethical compass. And, and do you feel like the leaders, though, are understanding or do understand it or they do benefit from the way the system is built? Probably both. I don't, you know, I, I am not... You know, I I am a researcher, right? We we founded a research institute, and a lot of what I do is you know look at the patterns of behavior across these companies. Are we seeing structural change that would actually result in significant improvements or you know clear answers to some of these problems? I think we have seen some of that. And, and we, it's interesting too. I mean, this is one of the things that we're we think is super important is how do you protect people inside companies who are going to be the whistleblowers, who are going to tell us things that we need to know, and who are actually going to sort of do this sort of organizing work. And, and one of the things that's super important is to start saying, hey, this is going to be important for journalism. This is going to be important mm -hmm. for research. It's going to be important for history that we understand how these systems work. So really being able to create structures where workers can unionize, where they can disclose, where they can actually hold to account the companies that they work for. I think this is going to be increasingly important, and it's something that we've you know, done quite a lot of research on. And then last question, and then we'll get to some questions from the audience. I've come to the conclusion recently that, you know, because we know most of these people, and I don't, I don't find them to be particularly evil, like in terms of like, I don't, we don't have like a chemical manufacturer like rubbing his hands <laughs> together going, ha ha, I've won, <laughs> that kind of thing. It's more like, oh no, I, I've come to the conclusion that perhaps they're incompetent. Mm. You know, the leaders are actually incompetent to the task, not stupid, but incompetent. They did not understand what they have created and now don't know yeah. what the hell to do. I, I guess I'd put it a little differently. I'd say, this field has worshipped at the altar of the technical for the better part of 60 years and at the expense of understanding the social and the ethical. And we are seeing the fruits of, of that prioritization. And it's interesting, because if you go back in the history of AI to the beginning in the sort of 1950s and 60s, it was a much more diverse field. You had anthropologists sitting at the table with computer scientists. Yes. It was this vision of how do we construct a world that we want to live in. Fair world. And we missed, we missed a boat for a couple of decades there by making that much narrower a conversation. And right now, as we, you know, we have these real issues of homogeneity in Silicon Valley, we need to open those doors up, but we also need to get people in the room who are the ones who are most likely to be seeing the downsides of this system. We have to center affected communities and not just you know, engineers on big salaries. And that's against the backdrop of AI becoming smarter and smarter and s as we move along. I mean, someone was saying they're like dolphins right now and they're moving up the I think I, I think that's I think that's not giving dolphins enough credit. Right. I think actually right. dolphins are pretty smart. Right. Um, I I think we're actually a way earlier stage than you might imagine. Okay. Um, I mean I think you know people are like oh we should be worried about the super intelligence. I'm like guys no it is so far from that. We're talking about like basic 101 stuff. I mean you know to the degree to which yeah AI systems can tell the difference between a cat and a dog, but you know there are a lot of things that it cannot do, and particularly the way that humans are classified right. by AI systems would curl your toes. Mm -hmm. I mean, some of this stuff is like really terrifyingly basic and often wrong. Mm -hmm. So I, I actually think dolphins are kind of a step ahead right. at this point, um, right. and we're, we're probably at the protozoa level at right. this point. <laughs> right, all right. As you know, when I interviewed Elon Musk a couple of years ago, who has talked about these issues of dangers of AI, um, he said he thinks, I was, we were talking about the Terminator ideas that go in movies and everything, and he said, no, they're gonna, eventually they're going to treat us like house cats. Um, we're just house cats. We'll be house cats to these systems. And they don't want to kill us necessarily. They just don't care. He's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny. I mean, I, I sometimes we very call colorful. this. You know, oh, we they want to kill us. The, so you say yeah. they want to kill us. It, yeah. it, it's true. I, I I think he's wrong across the board. I think the premise is faulty. Um, but it is a great distraction from the very real harms of 
faulty, broken, imperfect, profitable systems that are being, you know, mundanely and obscurely threaded through our social and economic systems. Oh, so right. we, we've, we've, we've called this the, uh, the the apex predator problem, which like if you're already an apex predator and you have all the money and all of the power in the world, what's the next thing to worry about? Oh, I know, super intelligent machines. That's right. the next threat to me. Um, but if you're not an apex predator, like if you're one of us, we've got real problems with the systems that are already deployed. So maybe let's right. focus on that. Including apex predators. Um, OK, all right, questions. <laughs> Quest they're actually not sure that's They're very anymore. easy to nag, just so you know. Um, uh, questions from the audience? Questions right here. Um, I was interested in your comment about GDPR in contrast to where the U.S. is in terms of privacy or tech regulation kind of generally and how, you know, it's important who gets to make the decisions, right? Is it, is it our democratically elected government and representatives here or, you know, someone somewhere else with, you know, different kind of public policy kind of considerations? So one of the challenges that I think U.S. regulators often have to grapple with is um, vis-a-vis -vis a lot of these industries, we've often prided ourselves on the idea of permissionless innovation. So, you know, what w the speculative harm about what, you know, the heavy hand of government can come in and, and do to these new right. emerging fields. Innovation. So, yes. Ruining innovation. Yeah. yeah. So how do you balance that? How do you think about the tension between the idea that in some ways we, we want this technology to be here in the United States because we think we have the best values and you know, we'll get to the right answers to these questions um, you know, versus, well, we, we have to put some rules of the road in place uh, prophylactically um, because an, you know, an ex post facto enforcement regime isn't going to protect people. Right, this idea of innovation, I mean, it, this is why we had Section 230, yeah. which now we've seen have been in place a little too long, uh, which is the immunity for most platforms to anything they do. Um, it's a get out of jail free card, essentially, for the, the internet industry. Um, so what do you think about that? The idea, because we do want this idea, this is, this is an issue when I did a podcast with Mark Zuckerberg, he's like, well, Kara, you know, we got China coming on strong and then you've got us and, you know, it, I called it the Xi or me argument, and I was like, <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, I don't want either of you. Do I have a third? Where's the third choice? So is there a Three. third option? Is there a third the option? False dichotomy. Right. <laughs> Although, I mean, he won on that one, but you know what I mean. But it was like a kind of an interest. That's I hear it from Silicon Valley all yeah. the time. Like, but it, it, but this is another false dichotomy too, and right. I, I love this question because so often, you know, we hear it's like innovation or you know rules of the road. Like we either have you know some type of guardrails or we have thriving AI. It's like Actually, guys, no. You will have thriving AI when we have guardrails, when we have safety, when we have protections. People will be much more likely to want to trust these tools when we know that it's not going to discriminate against us or harm us or cause other forms of like ongoing structural problems. So I, I think it's this, this, this tendency to, to see innovation as God and everything else is like restraining the power. And it's like, no, we actually will only have AI that is worthy of the name when it is really designed in harmony with the ways in which we want to live. I innovate on ethics, innovate on accountability, innovate on clear guardrails. Otherwise, I mean, I think it is really interesting how innovation has become basically tethered to sort of, you know, rising share prices for a couple of Silicon Valley companies, right? Is that what we mean by innovation? Or can we think about innovation and begin to redefine the term in ways that actually match our values more broadly? Um, also, it may not, in fact, be innovation. I think we're at our least startup yeah, it just creation cycle in 30 years. Right using now. Kara's framework on some spun up AWS instance right. is not necessarily that innovative. Yeah, I think our innovation issues have to do with other things besides this because it has to do with government research money. It has to do with all. But we are, I think, at a low of startup creation right now. And it has to do with large, giant companies dominating. Like Google bought, buys up every worthy AI company, if not Facebook and Amazon does. And so the whole culture doesn't. Come up. Someone's not going to displace them, essentially. Yeah. And I mean, you can ask the question like, if we begin to scratch the surface of the political economy of the AI industry, you, know, you, you see a number of AI startups. They're all over the place. But ask any one of them where do they host their infrastructure, right? Who runs their servers? It is Amazon, it is Microsoft, or it is Google, right? You can scratch below the surface a little more and say, like, actually, what kind of AI are you building? Oftentimes, these 
companies are in fact just sort of repackaging you know, models as a service that are sold by the big tech players. So again, you know, where is this actually accruing to? Who is actually creating AI? Who has the capabilities to create AI? Is a question I think we need to answer as we answer the questions around, you know, what would responsible AI look like and what should these guardrails look like? Okay, another question. Okay, and then over there. Hi everyone, Amanda Farnan with Politico. Thank you all for being here and hosting this important conversation today. Would love to bring it back to the Elon Musk comments and how this negative outlook on AI is quite easy for people who do not understand the opportunity to go down that rabbit hole of, oh, the negative ideas, the negative future, I don't wanna talk about it. How do you suggest opening up the conversation to people who either don't want to understand or don't have e the opportunity or the uh, conversation in their daily lives, how can we open that conversation to them, and what would you recommend? You, you so mean get it beyond the Arnold Schwarzenegger, exactly. I'm here to kill you kind of thing <laughs> from the future. Hopefully okay. we're all, all able to get beyond that conversation as well. Right, right. Well, he, Elon also thinks that we live in a simulation, so it doesn't really matter. <laughs> <laughs> Which would explain a lot about the Trump era, but go ahead. Yeah. It's, it's a bunch of futuristic people yeah. playing a game. We're all just uh. a game. Could have been more fun. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, I mean, I, I will answer this. I think, you know, I think part of the way you begin to get more people in the room is to focus not on this sort of technical wizardry on the shiny covered of some, you know, wired article. Or that but, it's going to kill us all. Or that it's going to kill us. These sort of, you know, speculative and, you know, hype-filled proclamations that focus on sort of tech wizardry, right? So it's the super intelligence or, you know, the next deep neural net, which is better than humans, which is, you know, a claim that, you know, Kate has examined and, and we're looking at. But, you know, it is actually affecting and shaping all of our lives in different ways, right? The harms are not evenly distributed, but this is in our lives, right? You, you know, there are license plate profiling AI that is sort of tracking people as they go over different bridges in New York. You have, you know, you have systems that are determining which school your child gets enrolled in. You have automated essay scoring systems that are determining whether it's, you know, written well enough, like, you know, whose version of written English is that, and what is it rewarding or not, what kind of creativity can get through that. You have, you know, systems that are being used, we have a, an example that is fairly chilling in Arkansas of an algorithmic system that was brought in to distribute Medicaid benefits. And this system was allocating the number of hours of home care treatment that you know, very ill patients got. So these are, you know, there was, there was one patient, Tammy Duck Duckworth, who had cerebral palsy and needed a lot of help, right? She needed help getting into bed and, you know, all, like just help having a dignified life at home. A caseworker shows up with his new system, sort of enters her info, it dropped her hours from something like 12 hours a day to eight. And I don't have the exact numbers, but it was enough that, you know, it seriously affected her quality of life. This was the difference between having a dignified life, living at home, getting the care she needed to survive, and not getting that. Now, thankfully, there was a lawyer who took that to court, contested the algorithm, found that it was actually, there was a major implementation flaw, there were all sorts of other problems, but neither the caseworker on the scene nor Tammy had the ability to contest that decision or override it. So, you know, I would answer these are profound and material harms that are happening. These are profound and material implications. Whether you get hired or not depends on whether you, you know, have an eye twitch in a higher view video, right? These are things that actually affect us, you know, right now, and I think we all have a stake in talking about them, they are part, you know, our experience matters just as much as a, you know, technical design doc or a, a wired article about the super intelligence. And I think part of the job to steer us toward a better future, you know, with these technologies is to begin to recenter the conversation around what the lived experience of having these technologies shape and direct our resources the and opportunities the stories is. stories of, of the effect. Okay. The stories, you're talking about the, like Tammy or the yeah. others. Yeah. And uh, up here? Oh. We'll try to get you just a few more and then we'll go. Hi. Um, just a quick question. I'm, I'm curious, in looking back in history, I'm sitting here with spinning and saying, is there something that, like, throughout different technology evolutions and disruptions, you know, back through whenever, that's, like, even analogous? Like, if, as you guys look mm -hmm. at the, the way this will sort of percolate through society, do you look back at any other kind of technology transitions in history for lessons learned and things like that? Like, and what are those? Oh, I love this question. Um, yeah, we do. In fact, you know, one of the things that, that we have is like we really focus on 
deep historical research because I think we can learn a lot exactly from moments in history where these big sort of general purpose technologies were sort of flooding into society and decisions had to be made about how to use them. I mean, one of the examples that I think you know people really go to a lot is is nuclear, right? Like, so we had this extraordinary potential for generating energy, but also terrifying horrors if it's actually used as a weapon. So what we saw was a really profound international conversation about how are we going to regulate this technology, this capacity. And we had the creation of things like the IAEA, the International Inspections Body, that could say, hey, we should be able to inspect how you're creating this, what you're working with. Do you have like weapons facilities? Do you have energy facilities? This was a big international effort. And that's a very difficult thing to do right now. If you look at what the international governance conversation looks like, it's much bleaker, right? And speaking from the US, it's real bleak right here right now. So, so how do we think about, like, what does an international governance conversation look like? I noticed that Mark Zuckerberg mentioned this in his most recent op-ed telling us how we should regulate the internet. He was like, you know, we need global governance. I'm like, well, that's great. But how are we going to get there right now? Because historically, I think we're in a very different moment. So I think you're right. We can look to these kind of key moments of technologies that really change the way we lived. But we also have to look at you know, what were the governance structures and how do we get there? And, and that's one of the big questions hovering over AI right now is you, know, you can come up with like local, re local regulation, but you're really talking about technologies that are planetary in scale. But these the, are planetary The only thing that's very different is you have never been tracked so beautifully ever in, the, in human history. Like, every, everyone here has a phone. You're all, it's not just biased data. There's so much data pouring out of this room right now, for example. It's, it's, in, it's insane <laughs> what's happening. And so that's the difficulty, mm -hmm. is the amount of data that's being collected about you right now. And the granularity of it. The granularity of it. Of it. And Everything. the intimacy of that. I mean, that, that's, right. that's the part that I think socially we're still catching up to what that's going to mean, what that means for the private, you know, private sector, what it means for the public sector, what it means for government. These are really big, hard, difficult questions. Because everyone's opted into this. Well, in some or cases, without knowing. Right. Did, were, did, was right. that informed consent, Cara? Right. I don't right. know. I, don't know. <laughs> I do know that my phone is one of the best relationships I've ever had in my life. But go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it definitely right. sticks with us. All right. One, one, one more question. Is that okay? One, one more question right here. Hi. Um, thanks for having me here. My name is Kendall Spencer. I'm a second year law student at Georgetown. Um, I think a lot of what we've talked about today has sort of come back to this issue of being able to ask the right questions. Um, for so many years in America, we've always focused on this idea of innovation, innovation, right. without really deciding what it is we want these technologies to be able to do, which has been one of the core issues. So as we start to get to this point of trying to find a um, correct and efficient regulatory regime for this type of stuff, I'm wondering if you know, what's the, like, what's really the right trajectory here? Is, is it better to, instead of try to regulate AI as a whole, to maybe think about, well, maybe we can regulate the type of information that AI is processing. Maybe that'll be a more effective way to do it in terms of if we're going to fit this under any umbrella um, whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, and that's part of what's happened in Europe is exactly that conversation with GDPR. I mean, there are, there are actually a lot of initiatives that are, that are trying to do just that, is to say what kind of data, in what context, held for how long. These are really good questions that we need to pursue a lot further. But what's interesting is that that's happening at a much slower rate than these technologies are being released into the world and essentially, you know, being live tested on populations all the time. So what we have is this kind of race now between how do you actually have those conversations with sufficient knowledge about how these tools really work when a lot of these things are protected by trade secrecy. A lot of these tools, you know, you, you're not going to know how it's working or what data is being collected. So there's a there's a real knowledge problem here as well in terms as well as that sort of speed problem of how do we catch up to what these technologies are doing. So I would say to you, yeah, we definitely need to do that to have those conversations, but we've got some real barriers in place. And they're the, they're the barriers that Meredith and I are most interested in addressing. Like, how do we create transparency? How do we create accountability? How do we have the public conversations about how we want these tools to work or not? Mm -hmm. Meredith, last word. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I mean, I, I think, you know, real talk for a second, you, know, you, you began that question beautifully by asking, you know, what do we want this innovation to do? And right now, this, this innovation is produced by a handful of private companies. They are the only companies that have the resources to build this kind of AI. There isn't a way to kind of bootstrap this from a startup in a garage. That's just not how this technology works. And you know, 
whatever else their calibration is, they're looking for shareholder value, right? So I think there is a this bigger question. This isn't a question. government initiative like the internet was. No, this is not a government initiative like the internet was. There are very different incentive structures baked into the DNA of how you know those who are in the position to produce this technology are thinking about what it does and who it benefits. So you know, this is again not to say this is sort of you know bad people. Um, this is to look at, you know, are these the incentives we want to govern a technology that is this pervasive and this powerful? And if not, what are the changes we would need to put in place? And, and you know, I'm going to leave it with that question. All right. Fantastic. <laughs> Kate and Mary.